Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the first part of our exciting double bill about the events that were happening 80 years ago, today and tomorrow, or today, tomorrow, and the next day. Operation Biting was the da a daring raid to, uh, well, we'll find out about the raid tomorrow, to, to knock out, steal radar secrets from the French coast. And, and today, my guest, one of those people who I, I've just said it privately, but I will say it publicly. I want to thank Damien Lewis for being one of those people who supported me in the early days of this channel. Now we're getting a bit of traction. We're getting bigger, bigger, bigger viewing numbers, but it's only because people like Damien supported me at the beginning and came on when we were a little small channel with a very small following. But if you are new to World War II TV, don't forget to click subscribe. Don't forget to click like. But today's author, I just mentioned him, Damien Lewis, wrote this book, which is one of the books I use to study the Brunaval attack. Uh, SAS Shadow Raiders, and if you're wondering where the SAS bit comes into what you think is a parachute regiment assault, well, we'll fight, hold the hold the fort. We're getting there in a minute. Um, so, um, that's what we're talking about. And of course, the link to the book is in the description below. So, I'm gonna bring in Damien now. So, good evening, Damien. How are you? Yeah, I'm. I'm very good. Very good to be back, and glad to see things are really flying for you. It's fantastic. Well, well, thank you. So. 80 years ago was this event happening and it as we're going to find out tonight the raid itself which we're covering tomorrow was amazing but the preparation for it had just as much excitement involved just as many fascinating characters so you know where does it all start you know we we know that with you've been on the show before 1940 churchill gives the order that you know we must strike back to occupied countries we must start this kind of new commando warfare but in terms of what we're talking about this weekend, how does it all start for the British? Yeah, I mean, in a way, and this is where the book kind of starts. It's, it starts with um, uh, Dudley Clark, Colonel Dudley Clark, who is known as a kind of genius of deception in the Second World War. But, um, you know, shortly after Dunkirk, about 48 hours after Dunkirk, he scribbled on the back of an envelope a plan for what he he then termed uh, the commandos. And it was based upon the idea of the Boer War and the Boer commandos, who were, of course, irregular fighters who, you know, wore their own farming clothes, carried their own weapons, rode their own horses, really guerrilla warfare behind the lines and very, very successful against the British. And Dudley Clark had lived in South Africa. He'd been besieged by the Boer um, in various places. And uh, he figured that after Dunkirk, we needed to strike back, and the way to do so was to raise something similar to the Boer Commander. So he wrote this back of an envelope plan, and he happened to have access via his his commanding officer to to Churchill. Plan was put to Churchill, and you know typically Churchill was uh, grabbed it with both hands and decided this was exactly what Britain needed at our darkest hour, and he ordered Clark. You know, gave the green green light, uh, and he ordered Clark to get a commando raid back across the uh, the English Channel to hit a German position on the French coast within the end of the month. Now, just imagine what kind of um, gargantuan challenge that was. Dudley Clark had no recruits, no equipment. This kind of warfare had never been fought before. He had no one to train these people. This was uh, an extraordinary, um, you know, uh, uh, ever a slight challenge. Clark got that raid back across the coast, 90 men in RAF crash boats, crossed the channel, raided a German position, came back to the UK. In the greater scheme of the war, a pinprick. Why was it important? Because the next day it was headline news in the British press and the American press, the British bulldog finds its bark. It gave us the belief, which, and by Christ did we need it at the time, mm. that we could fight and we could stand. Now, from that, uh, so, so they, were, they were all volunteers. They were special service volunteers. And Churchill, who'd seen... The Germans carry out the first ever airborne operations, of course, when they took the Low Countries. So glider-borne and uh, parachute-borne troops. Very impressed. And he said, I want uh, 10,000 commandos and, and 5,000 airborne commandos recruited and trained by the turn of the year. And because they were special service volunteers, the airborne commandos became the special air service volunteers. And and they formed the first unit that was formed of these airborne troops and trained was 11 Special Air Service Brigade, which was trained at Ringway just outside of Manchester. So that was actually the, the birth of the SAS name, which is autumn 1940. And just as a kind of fascinating aside, um, you know. Dudley Clark and Churchill were determined that the, 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 the overall name would be the commandos. The war office, the war cabinet were aghast because they 
uh, determined that uh, you know this was this connoted Boer-like troops who would be you know irregular, dressed in a regular uniform, and wasn't a done thing for the British Army. And so when Dudley Clark asked the the, the War Cabinet what they thought they should be called, they said they should be called the the Special Service Troop or the SS for short. At which stage uh, Clark and Clark got Churchill put his foot down, and they became uh, you know they they got the imprimatur, the commandos, and so those the first. So, and why was it called 11 Special Air Service Brigade, the first airborne troops? It was called 11 uh, Special Air Service Brigade because, like I said, Clark was a brilliant uh, strategist and deceptionist. Deception was his big thing during the war. And he figured, rightly, that if you called them 11 Special Air Service Brigade, then the enemy might conclude that there were already 10 other spe similar Special Air Service Brigades, 1 to 10, all of 500 troops, which would mean you had thousands of airborne troops already uh, trained and formed and, and once those the 500 were trained of course and and they were ready to, to to deploy they needed an operation and this led to one of the most extraordinary operations of the war so in 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 february 41 uh 36 of these airborne commandos flew from the uk in the first ever airborne operation by allied forces to italy via malta and they parachuted over the Trino aqueduct which was a which is a uh, an aqueduct that carries fresh water to the southern uh, Italian cities. And it was a, actually a special operations executive um, uh, 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 dreamt up operation. And the, the aim of it, and it was codenamed Operation Colossus, was to basically blow up the Trigino aqueduct and deprive three million Italians of fresh drinking water. And those were the Italians who populated the ports, the southern Italian ports, from which the Italians were sending troops and war material to North Africa. So very strategic operation. And, and, and the operation went ahead. It was, it was incredibly successful, bearing in mind the huge distances they had to cover and the fact there had never been an airborne operation before and they had to parachute into the Apennine Mountains. The guys got on the ground, one, one, uh, one stick, which unfortunately was most of the sappers failed to drop in the right valley. But but a Lieutenant Patterson, a Canadian, who was the one sapper who remained, masterminded the sabotage of one of the piers of the aqueduct, and they they blew it up and and they 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 uh, truncated the aqueduct and 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 broke the water supply. Um, it had a kind of tragic end in that reconnaissance photos taken the day after of of the attack site supposedly showed that the aqueduct was intact. So. The, the, planners presumed the mission was a failure and so they recalled the submarine that had been sent in to, to to rescue the raiders from the from the western italian coast which is where they were supposed to trek to to escape but even so it was it was you know it was proof of concept that that small bands of men could be inserted long mm -hmm. hundreds of miles behind enemy lines to carry out pinpoint accurate operations and and confound and and spread fear and terror into the enemy, which is exactly what Churchill had, had charged them to do, you know, spread a reign of terror down the enemy coasts. And of course, it, that, that, that cadre of men, that mission, was the, the very start, the very genesis of British airborne forces. And, and well, well explained there, but of course it could have ended things because, you know, we, as we know, and we covered it on the channel recently, the men pretty much all got captured from that raid there. You know, the, so, so at that point, the plan could have been abandoned, you know, because yes, it had, su it had succeeded, but they then had this idea that perhaps it hadn't succeeded as well as they thought it was, and the men get captured. You know, as we've talked about before on this channel, a lot of these fledgling special forces units don't make it through those first few months because they morph into something else or a commander gets brought in somewhere else because all these new rival units are desperate for the creative and uh, type of folk that they want. So the, the, the SAS, LRDG, so on. So, on. so it, the whole concept could have been abandoned. So as we're going to find out now, they need to now continue this idea, but with a mission that is, is going to be something that is so important that no one can say no to it, which is where we're coming in. To the, 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 the two things I think the Germans have that we are terribly worried about in 1941-42, one is, is Enigma and the codes. Which all leads to the pinch raids and 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 trying to get our hands on a, on a later on a, on the, the rotor machines. Yeah. The other is this technology the Germans have that we believe might be better than ours, which is radar. And I'm going to hand back to you to talk about just how important radar was in the early days of World War Two. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, our, our, our radar scientists at the start of the war largely believed that uh, radar was a British invention uh, and that only we had it. In fact, we were wrong. The Germans had it. And, and you could argue that their radar was was uh, better and more advanced than ours. And and uh, R.V. Jones, who was the kind of the king of radar technology, he was also the British scientist who worked within the secret intelligence service. So he was the scientist of the spies. R.V. Jones became more and more convinced that the Germans had something akin to ours. And the first suggestion of this was uh, was the Freya uh, radars, which were captured on um, on reconnaissance photographs. So these are, if you can imagine, a a, a sprung mattress. They go laying on its side. These were the Freya radars, pretty static, pretty fixed in position, and they rotate, and they uh, and they capture a radar image in three hundred and sixty degrees. So we suspected that these were radar installations. And so the search was underway to find where exactly these radars were positioned, particularly along the French coastline, but all of, of, of Europe, Europe's coastline occupied by Germany, to try and work out what they, what, what they were for, what their aims were, and what impediment they would prove to British bombing raids, Allied bombing raids, because, you know, especially when the Eastern Front opened, uh, you know, and the Russians were taking a hammering, the one thing that we could do uh, in Britain to try and relieve the pressure was to send in the bombing raids. And uh, and our losses in, in this early stage of the war were seen as being unsustainable. You know, they crunched the numbers and they realised that with the number of uh, 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 bombers we were losing, we just couldn't keep it up. And so radar, finding out what the Germans had in terms of radar was seen as being crucial. And so this led to, takes us to RAF Medmanham, which was a, um, a an incredible institution. It was basically the headquarters of ours and then the Americans photo reconnaissance, this craft, which was developed to a, to, to the nth degree during world war two. In fact, by the end of the war, there are figures which suggest that, you know, no, no allied general would move uh, in pretty much any major operation without aerial reconnaissance beforehand. And so RF Medman, and there was a fantastic, uh, talented um, photo reconnaissance um, expert. So these individuals who had this, the job simply of looking at photos that were brought back and trying to interpret them and work out what they are. And this chap one day was looking at some photographs of the French coast, French cliff tops um, near Bruneval, a, a village just across the channel on the French coast. And he saw something which could have been a speck of dust on the film, could have been a French cow, could have been a bush, but something, his instinct, and it was very instinctive, this craft, suggested to him that it was just not quite right. And so he asked to get a, an RAF reconnaissance flight over that, that position, uh, you know, very shortly. Now, these men who flew these flights were incredibly courageous individuals because they were flying these unarmed Spitfires, um, you know, polished, uh, stripped of weapons, um, tweaked for maximum speed. And their only defence was speed uh, and, tr and, and trying to outrun the enemy. So these were very very brave individuals. Tony Hill is the man who agreed to fly the flight. And that first that first uh, reconnaissance flight, he came up over the Bruneval Cliffs. In fact, he approached at such a low level that they didn't see him until he came up over the cliff tops because he was below that level. And as he came up over the cliff tops, he fired off his camera, so he thought, but he also saw with the naked eye this um, bizarre looking kind of 1920s chateau. And that which you can see, the, the, the circular dot there on the screen, which he saw and realized looked like uh, a, 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 a a bowl fire, as he described it at the time, an electric bowl fire, or as we might describe it, a sky dish today. He saw it with his naked eye. And when he got back to the UK, obviously extremely excited, came to came to RF Medmahon to, you know, to deliver the news. But unfortunately, his camera had malfunctioned. And so there was nothing captured on film. And at Medmahon, they said, but this is great. It's fantastic. You've seen it, but we need proof. And so... Um, there was actually a rule, standing rule in place that no um, reconnaissance deployment was allowed to visit the same location, you know, within a certain period of time, 48 hours, 72 hours, for obvious reasons, forewarned is forearmed. And Hill refused to abide by that rule. And within the next 48 hours, he flew a mission to exactly the same spot uh, over Bruneval, and he captured what are um, some of the most um, iconic uh, images of the war. These 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 images of, of of the what what we then knew was the Würzburg radar. This this bold radar uh, sitting atop the the the, the French cliff tops, and he brought them back to RF Medemann. Now, 
this is what um, uh, the proto reconnaissance guys had asked for. They'd asked for proof that this speck of dust was something. OK, but now we had to work out what exactly it was, what it did, what it was there for and what threat it posed to our aircraft. And uh, and if it was just a threat to aircraft, maybe it's a threat to shipping as well. We just didn't know. And we had nothing like this. You know, our radar was based upon Chain Home. Now, Chain Home mm. were these massive radar towers along the British coast. This this the, the Wurzburg, uh, you know, dish is just a few feet across mobile. They, they presumed it was directional. So you could you could hone it onto a target. It was a very, very different kettle of fish from anything that we had seen before. And it was. And it was it was it was extremely worrying. And just to, to talk about Jones again for a second, because yeah. we're talking about the year after the, the we have just depended on radar to get us through the Battle of Britain. It has become right. the thing that we have everybody believes is that is the wonder of the world. It is yes. great. It has worked. It said, yeah. and now Jones is pointing out to everybody that actually yeah. the Germans may have something not just as good but possibly yeah. better so yeah. so he's really rocking at the boat at this point because yeah. the world it's like the magic it's like the french and their faith in the maginot line isn't it to, a, yeah. to an extent and so jones is really butting the trend by, by yeah. this isn't it because admitting that maybe the germans are ahead of the game is huge yeah no this was heresy trust me this was heresy and there were you know there were the great and the good of the british radar world who were incensed that jones was very young man you know he was the young upstart and and he they tried to freeze him out but but you know jones was um apart from his remarkable scientific gifts he was a very um he, he wouldn't he wouldn't let it die he knew what he was talking about and the evidence was building and once we had this once we had this uh reconnaissance photo i mean you know What's this happened? the radar and we had to investigate so this was the beginning of going back to the 11 special air service brigade and then you know the, the the birth of the parachute regiment this was the beginning of a mission a new mission for british airborne forces and in a sense there's kind of like a is chicken and egg thing were the airborne forces put the Würzburg was found or had they been trained anyway and was Würzburg just the first real mission they had to undertake. In a sense, it doesn't matter. This was a, a snatch and grab operation, which is what we then conceived of. The only forces that could carry it out were were the commandos or, or, or the airborne uh, raiding raiding forces. And it was self-evident. It was obvious because of the massive German defensive on the coast, you could not land a force by sea. The only way it was deemed you could do this was to fly in by air, actually drop your force quite a distance behind the cliffs, behind the defences, which look out to sea, obviously, advance from, from inland to the Würzburg site, seize the radar, and and then the, the, the plan that was put together was to then take it apart, carry it down to the beach, uh, and, and and then a a, a force would, would approach from the beach once the guns had been silenced to load the, 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 the booty, the loot aboard, and bring it back to the UK. Um, obviously, so many things that could go wrong. So many things that could go wrong. And what we lacked, what we really crucially lacked, we had the reconnaissance photographs, uh, but what we absolutely lacked in terms of planning this operation was intelligence on the ground. Mm. Now, it's a fascinating thing. Um, when France fell, and it fell with such alacrity, it fell with such a speed that no one had ever envisaged. British and French intelligence before the war, in, during the phony war, before, before even before the war, were convinced that France would not prevail. Fact, okay? They had plans in place to try and work together after the fall of France, but because the fall was so precipitate, that they were those plans were in tatters. And at the, so, once the forces of Nazi Germany had seized France, we had no, no zero intelligence operators in France anymore. We had no sources. And just think about that for a moment. France was completely had gone completely dark in terms of intelligence. So what we needed. Was we needed intelligence on the ground at the Brunabar site to tell us crucially what were the German defences that had to be taken out 
so that we could land the boats on the beaches to take the radar away. And secondly, was the beach landable? Could you actually land on that beach? The tides, the depth, were there Were there underwater defences, things you couldn't see on a reconnaissance photo? So how could we get that intelligence? And that's where, um, you know, the heroism of, of the French and the French resistance comes into play. So one of the um, foremost uh, French resistance he heroes um, was a chap known by his nom de guerre, Colonel Remy, but his real name was, was Gilbert Renault. He's on screen now. Um, and... You know, um, I, I have, um, you know, over time had a lot of contact with his family um, and uh, and they, they've been extremely helpful in 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 my research into, into his his track record and his extraordinary, incredible, um, you know, work during the war. So Remy um, had got to the UK um, early on in the conflict and had been dropped back into France to found what he then called the Confrère de Notre Dame. The Brotherhood of Notre Dame. This was a resistance network, and it was to Remy that the approach was made to find out if he could get his people into the Bruneval site to get the intelligence we needed on those defences on the beach, on the garrisons, on the strength of the defenders, and somehow then get it back to the UK. The whole thing is a, is is an incredible um, demand of him, uh, if for no other reason that, as you know, the French. There was a, there was a exclusion zone along the French coastline. So, in fact, along all occupied uh, coastlines, so that you know only people with special permits were allowed in those areas for obvious reasons. The Germans, who were occupiers, who were resented by the local population, realised that if there were lots of Frenchmen wandering around on on the French cliff tops, they might be gathering intelligence. So it was very very hard to get into these areas. Uh, it just so happened that that Remé had in his network uh, a, a a guy who. Um, was basically around a garage and repaired cars. And so because of that, he had one of these passes to, to, to travel in the exclusion zone, the coastal zone. And he charged him, another individual, to get into Bruneval and to gather that, that vital information. And the way they did it, um, it's it just incredibly courageous. So one of the chaps posed as a, as, as a um, having a vacation from Paris, and they managed to walk down the road that leads to the beach talk to the German sentries, okay, and convince the German sentry that they were good patriotic Frenchmen, i.e. collaborators with the Germans, and that because this, this individual's cousin lived in Paris and hadn't seen the sea since the outbreak of the war, all he wanted to do was just gaze out to the sea and, you know, and, and the highlight of his holiday, and the German guard allowed him through. And not only did he, did he allow him through, but where there were signposts indicating a minefield, the German guard led them through that supposed minefield to enjoy the sea air and look at the sea. So they realized the minefield was actually uh, not, not, not there at all. It was actually just a bluff. And so from that, Remy's network were able to gather. And that picture you just pulled up, that was the German guard post right on the beach. Here's the beach in the foreground, German guard post in the background. So Remy's people were able to gather chapter and verse on the beach itself and the defenses um, which would menace it when the flotilla came in to collect the Würzburg radar. Um, and actually, one of the really fascinating things about it, it Reme then took that intelligence that they gathered and flew to the UK and delivered it by hand in one of these, um, you know, very heroic SOE Lysander operations. But the one thing that we kind of still um, lacked in terms of intelligence or weren't completely sure of was we, we, we knew that there were no defences under the water because none were visible to Remy's men. Yeah, It was pretty obvious there was nothing there. We didn't know what the depth was and, and what the tide was uh, for, for the beach itself because they obviously hadn't been allowed to go in the water. And it was then that somebody found a postcard, and I think it was actually, they found it in a guidebook, but it, it was a pre-war postcard, which showed, and it was kind of like a shot from on the cliff tops, and it showed bathers in the sea. And the intelligence boffins in the UK managed to work out that from the depth the, the bathers were at, i.e. was it at that waist, was it at their chest, and the, and the distance they were away from the beach, they managed to work out how steeply the beach itself shelved, and therefore that it would be possible to get a landing craft in there to um, pick up the Würzburg radar. And so at that stage, we had a pretty good intelligence picture. Um, what we didn't have was a man who well we did have but he had been told he couldn't go we need the, the raiders said we can go in there take out the enemy 
and sees the Würzburg site. That's within our capabilities. You know, however, Jones had drawn up literally a shopping list. It's in the files of the National Archives. He's got a shopping list of all the things he wants from the Würzburg disc. And right at the top is the uh, the antenna that spins around in within the dish itself. So this thing here, you can see it poking out. And then it goes all the way through. He wants the the label the, the 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 labels off the machinery so they can work out who makes it, where it's from, what what the se se the, what, what the serial number is, how many have been made. There's a shopping list of around a dozen crucial bits of this machine that they want. They want it all, but if you don't have time, get us the one, two, and three, and four. And so it needed somebody who had the technical expertise to take apart. This 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 Würzburg radar and steal the bits that that were top of the list, okay? And the, the, obviously R. V. Jones couldn't go because he absolutely knew too much. He was the scientist of the spies, and so another individual stepped forward who worked um, in in the radar establishment down in in Swanage in Dorset, and he actually volunteered to go on the mission, be parachuted in. He was actually on his way for airborne training when it was realised that hold on a minute, if we parachute this radar expert in. And the mission goes wrong. The Germans will capture him unless he's killed, and then they will find out about our radar. And actually, mission to steal their radar would have completely backfired. So he was told he couldn't go. And eventually, there was a um, a, 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 a minor radar technician. He was he was an RAF um, uh, sergeant, if I if my memory serves me well. Name name of Cox anyway. Yeah. Working on an installation in in the West Country, and and he got a order to travel to london and a rail warrant and he turned up at um at, at headquarters in london and was and was told he was volunteering and he said well what am i volunteering for and they said well we can't tell you because it's too secret you just have to volunteer so he said all right i volunteer then and that's how cox became went to ringway was trained as did his did his six parachute jumps in fact two of them went so two of them were volunteered cox got through his parachute course the other guy injured himself in training and so cox was the last piece of the jigsaw puzzle you can argue because he was then the guy who was going to parachute in with major frost and his raiders and actually take the Würzburg apart and get the pieces that rb jones said were absolutely vital and of course they had their foldable shopping trolleys in which they were going to load all the vital pieces of the radar and take them down the cliff face and get them onto the flotilla and well and brilliantly explained and yeah i just want to kind of um clarify the fact that when we're talking about special forces operations that are simply about blowing things up they're fantastic they're, in, they're you know they're brilliant to read about to, to talk about to, but when there's intelligence involved there's that whole next level of complications because we have the same thing with dave roberts talking about 30 assault unit who are trying to find out stuff about german technology and torpedoes and radar things is if you send in people who know what they're looking for and as you say, they then get captured. Your attempt to get, to get one over on the enemy then becomes them getting one over you. So you have to find someone who knows what the items are on the shopping list but doesn't know the cake the ingredients make. And, and that is a level of complication that is really, really insane about these early operations. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the individual who was slated to go after Jones, the one they eventually said you can't go because you know too much, it was pretty obvious from the orders that were that that, that, that that in the archives that had he been in danger of being taken captive, they would not have allowed him to be captured. They would have uh, ended his life. You know, pretty grim stuff. But that's what what that's what was required. Cox was was of a level of expertise which was pretty lowly. If he got captured, it didn't matter. But he had the technical expertise and ability to take a Würzburg apart and get yeah. get the bits that R. V. Jones wanted. So. You know that was a that was a level of risk that was that was doable, acceptable, and without that, you're absolutely right. You know, you had a hundred men going in on a raid who, who could absolutely carry out the, the the suppression of the enemy, could actually absolutely see the, seize the Würzburg site, could carry the kit down to the beach and load it aboard the boats. But what they couldn't do is is choose the pieces that needed to be. That, you know, needed to be prioritised in terms of bringing them back to the UK and make sure they took it apart in such a way that they were then um, usable. Because, you know, bear in mind, the aim of this, you know, the, the, the avowed aim of this was to actually get the Würzburg back to the UK. You know, ideal scenario, get it back to the UK, rebuild it, power it up, and then study it 
to see how it works and then replicate it so we could then build our own versions. That was the plan. So to be able to do that, you've actually got to steal this very carefully. And also not leave evidence that you have stripped off the interesting bits to the Germans. So the Germans yeah, then absolutely. come and find it and go, hang on, they've just taken off yeah. part A. They, you've got to do enough damage as well to conceal right. within your raid, yeah. make it look like it is just an aggressive raid to blow yeah. things up. And it's these layers of complication that make it so fascinating. I want to bring you back to the French side of the story because yeah. I've got the original um uh, the George Miller book about Bruno oh, yes. Val, which is yeah, written yeah. just after, and he was famously in the World War II, and the French involvement kind of isn't really in the book because this had this the story ended up becoming, a, as we, people in the sidebar are saying, a very British boy's own story about yeah. Major Frost, who then became Colonel Frost. The oh, yeah. has that act of daring do, and I know because of the other books you've written, you love to bring in the international side of these operations and make yeah. sure we don't see them as just a yeah. British upper class game into into yeah, occupied Europe. Right. And so when you said about the the, the you know these these brave people like Colonel Remy going down and fighting at the beach, I know there are people watching who've seen shows with me where we've talked about 1944 when we have this database about the coasts of Europe. We've got the millions of photos now, and I'm not exaggerating, probably is millions of photos of Medmen and and we have this information about soil samples and beach and yeah. tides. We also, by 1944, have a very established network within the occupied Europe because the tide of war has turned. Yeah. In 42, if you're living in France, it looks like the Germans are winning still. And, yeah. and anybody who, who bravely goes out there and risks yeah. their, their, their life in 42 is a hero in my book. And I know Absolutely. you're very keen to, to talk Absolutely. about these people like Remy yeah. because... If they get captured, it's not just them; it's their wives, their children, their families. So, so talk a bit about your 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 need to bring in the French side. So, so Colonel Colonel Remy, you know, um, a lot of things fall out of that. So, one of the fascinating things about this is is that when you, if you carry out resistance activity, so sabotage of you know, German operations, whatever it might be, or, 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 or infrastructure, or if you carry out military operations, um, they're very different from intelligence gathering. Intelligence gathering in France, all intelligence operations, and, and particular ones which involved um, top secret technology, were basically subjected to at least a 30 year rule, where you were not allowed to talk about them. So for a long time after the war, no one really talked in France about these these incredible uh, intelligence gathering missions. So that was one of the reasons why a lot of the French involvement wasn't really that well known about. But just to give you an indication of the kind of risks that, that, that these individuals were taking, and, and, you know, some of them from 1940 onwards, let's bear in mind, you know, Colonel Remy was back in France very quickly, okay? Remy's sister was also um, a, 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 a resistance and intelligence operative. She was captured and she ended up in the concentration camp. This was a family business. And, you know, the Gestapo knew that, well, it's a very rare man who under torture, if captured by the Gestapo, didn't talk. But it's an even rarer man who, if he knows his sister or his mother has been captured and is being tortured, won't talk. Imagine it. Imagine what that or, or his children. Imagine what that does to an individual. So the risks involved in being a, a French or a Dutch or a Norwegian or, or an Italian or a Spanish, uh, you know, resistance operator or intelligence gatherer for the British were legion in an occupied country or even in a neutral country like Spain, which was de facto occupied but by the Germans. The Gestapo and SS were everywhere. The risks were legion and the level of bravery involved is it is, is absolutely stunning uh, you know if you read any of Remy's books and he's written he wrote a lot after the war um they are testimonies to to you know repeated missions of incredible courage and daring and rightfully so he you know he was recognized by by the british and the allies as being a standout hero of the war and he's just one one of many so you know the Bruneval raid, yes, a incredible um, British snatch and grab operation. The first ever airborne raid mounted from British soil. OK, Colossus had happened, but bear in mind they stopped off in Malta, so it wasn't mounted directly from British soil. This is the first one. And, you know, 
as proof of concept, it could not have been better. However, without the French, uh, you know, resistance and intelligence um, operators on the ground, who knows what might have happened had we not had that intelligence to hand, especially for the plans. I mean, just to give you an example, they built, um, you know, they built these these replicas at RAF Medman of the cliffs, of the beaches, of the Würzburg, and all the French measurements, pacing out, all, you know, all the different um, routes and roads and and defences that that Remy and his men did were crucial to that to that um, to that being possible. You know, that was the model which, and we I don't we don't want to talk about the raid. So, but you know, after the raid, Churchill, you know, traced the the line of the. Um, the path down the beach and 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 you know, the route from the work works but to the beach with his hand on the model and said this is the way we have to go in this is the way it was done so all of that intelligence which allowed us to those men being sent in to study it in great detail it allowed the air crew to study it in great detail you know at medman that they, they built these models but they also managed to light them so these these are scale models they look like the real thing they managed to light them in such a way that it actually it appeared like a, the cliffs would look and sea would look on a moonlit night on the night that they were intended to go in. Yeah. During that moon window when there was enough illumination to parachute in, but not too much illumination to get the aircraft shot down. You know, and all of that was facilitated by, in part, intelligence gathering on the ground by very, very great, brave men and women. And And was there... Uh, and a consideration because we won't, we won't talk about the raid itself. But if it goes wrong, an escape plan. Because going back to Operation Colossus, as we talked about earlier, the tragedy of that was is the operation itself was pretty successful, but they just didn't get out because you know the bo a bomber had crashed near where the submarine was coming, and 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 they all get picked up, and most of them spend the rest of the of the war in the POW camp, except for the ones who they the Germans identified as being foreigners who were brutally tortured, and that's another story in its own right. But with that experience behind them, we now know that these the paratroopers were evacuated from the beach. The, the beach is okay for landing craft, but what if that isn't possible? Are Colonel Remy and his team going to do anything to try and get these these people out by other means? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, um, the escape plan was to link up with the resistance, but but you know, frankly, Paul, there wasn't an escape plan. That's the truth. The, the truth was, you go in and you pull this mission off, and it cannot fail. That's the truth. That's what they were told. Um, yeah, OK, they were told if, you know, any of you get isolated, you know, and, and, and you're in danger of capture, go and, you know, talk to the local farmer. They're generally in resistance. They will look after you. But just going back to the Colossus thing, actually, several of them did escape. They were captured, yes, mm. but several of them did actually manage to escape and get back to, to um, you know, Allied lines. And some of them have the most uh, the most unbelievable escape stories. So, you know, um, even in a situation where they were where they were all captured in the first instance, there was still the means to to, um, you know, to try to um, get back and fight another day. But you're right. You know, in this situation, yes, they, they, they would try to link up with the resistance and try to rely on them to get them back to Allied lines. And there were the escape lines, as we all know, you know, in the Second World War, which did get lots of Allied servicemen and women back to the UK. But. The truth of the matter was, with a raid of this import, they were told, you go in there and get that Wurzburg disc, come hell or high water, there can be no failure. Hmm. You know, but and actually, and actually, going back to what you're talking about in terms of, you know, disguising the fact that they'd stolen it, they took in demolitions charges so that when Cox had done all this dismantling and had loaded the shopping trolleys with all the loot to take it down the path to the beach, they then set the demolitions charges up, blew up what remained. So when the when the enemy in, investigated the next morning, it might appear as if this had just been a raid to destroy the radar, not to steal it. You know, definitely. And again, bringing up the idea of the resistance is that if the worst comes to worst and some of the British paratroopers get captured and the Germans interrogate them and realise how well put together this plan was, they might correctly draw the conclusion they must have had assistance from in country from the french right. and again if you're a british paratrooper your the likelihood is you're going to get taken off to a prisoner war camp and maybe you spend the rest of the war in a bag but if they get information that the french have been involved all colonel remy and his associates and that, that they are in even more danger again so i i, I don't no, think no, we no, can no, overplay no. how much risk these people are putting into this you're absolutely right i mean you know these were these were individuals operating in civilian clothes 
and and actually because of the French armistice, you know, with the Germans under the the, the laws then in the land, it was actually illegal to to you know being cahoots with the Allies in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, arguably under French law, you were a traitor, uh, certainly a traitor to the Vichy state, and therefore you know the death penalty was your just desert. So you were risking everything. And and some of the Operation Biting Raiders didn't get home, of course. A mm. handful of them missed the boat home. Complete, you know, um, yeah, the fog of war. Some of the, a handful of them were left on the beaches. And and some of them did get very far with the help of, of the resistance back toward allies, Allied lines. But they were eventually all captured. And most of them were, you know, treated as prisoners of war, bona fide prisoners of war. They were British troops deploying in, 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 in full British uniform as bona fide combatants. And you're absolutely right again, you know, in the uh, immediate aftermath of the raid, you know, with Hitler demanding answers, how could this happen? How could they have stolen our top secret kit? The, 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 the suspicion did fall upon the locals and mm -hmm. there were reprisals taken. So these were the risks that they, they ran whenever any individual, man, woman, child, whatever it might be, agreed to carry out some kind of work to help the Allied cause. No, definitely, and, and I, I want to, you know, we will bring things to an end eventually. But um, uh, we talk about this because we're British, as this again, this British raid of huge significance because of Major Frost becoming Colonel Frost. There's the Arnhem connection; it it, it connects with the SAS formation of airborne forces. But we we mustn't forget, folks, that in 1947, Charles de Gaulle gives a speech at Bruneval. And, and this, these are photos here for the 20th anniversary, so 1962. This was a big French story as well. They, they see this very much as part of their history. Um, and so, we again, this is the, the connection here with the – these are photos, folks, from the 1962 20th anniversary. These are people – we don't know exactly who they are in the photo, even in the French film this is from. They don't name who these are, these are. But these is part of this same network that Colonel Remy established. And 14 – this is not this is the 1962 ceremony. But in 47, when Charles de Gaulle laid the first stone at the monument, 14,000 French civilians filled a little valley that – now there's parking for about 20 cars there. It, it's insane how big this was for the French. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, look, I, I think I said to you before, you know, earlier today that, you know, that, that I've been, you know, um, in, in, in contact with, with, with Colonel Remy's family. And they've, they, you know, just recently they've set up an association to, to uh, commemorate and remember his name and his legacy and all those all those individuals who worked in his network, this memory is ongoing. This legacy is ongoing. How many times have I been to France to, to ceremonies just like this, that, that, just like this today? OK, I haven't been for about a year because of COVID, but before that, pretty much every year to ceremonies like this, exactly like this today. French men and women stepping out into their little village to a to a memorial, often, often. To, to British and, 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 and allied troops who were murdered by SS Gestapo and to French men and women who, who, who were also murdered because they operated alongside them, because they gave them shelter, they gave them sanctuary. This is a living memory. And, and it's great that the French cherish that even to this day. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Well, so I said, we're not doing the raid itself, but let's look at it from the point of view of where this raid sits in the historiography of the, 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 the Airborne Forces, SAS, Parachute Regiment, because, you know, you've written numerous books about this subject. This, this is a really big one, isn't it? This is the one that proves that these concepts not only work in terms of sending a message to the enemy and an end, a propaganda message to the public, they can actually be constructive to the war effort, because this information that we gathered about the radar, essentially, I'm skipping ahead, folks, is the information we then used I'm saying we, I did, wasn't part of it. But the window, the, the foil strips we dropped on June the 6th, 1944. We, we, we jammed the German radar on D-Day to get our fleet across. It's a very yeah. simple way of putting it. In, you know, absolutely, you know, the ramifications were incalculable. And, you know, it had, as you say, on D-Day, this was, this was, yeah, in terms of deception operations on D-Day, this was absolutely vital. So... In terms of the kind of like pedigree of airborne forces, this was the raid. This was the raid that proved that that the concept of airborne operation was doable. It could it could have absolutely game changing consequences, and that small groups of highly trained and highly motivated individuals deployed 
behind the enemy lines, you know, in ways that the enemy don't expect could have could be a massive force multiplier. And, and as you say, massively dis, dis, disincentivize the enemy because they'd never know where they were strike there. This uh, Operation Biting was the beginning. You could argue Colossus was, but there was this big hangover of, well, was it a failure? Was it a success? No one really knew. Paul, until the first escapee got back to the UK, Dean Drummond, right? And he said, this is what we did and gave chapter and verse eyewitness account of blowing up the aqueduct. No one knew. And that took several months. So biting was the mission that proved the concept and is the laid the foundation stone for the airborne forces that we have today. Yeah. And, and I think I want to bring it just back to, to RV Jones as well, because the a recurring theme this week in talking about special forces, it's all very well having these groups of highly trained specialists, but you've got to find missions for them worthy of these talents because you can kind of send anybody in to just be aggressive and blow things up. It's about, and I'm being dismissive of what these people do, but it's the ideas behind it. And th these kind of geniuses are just as important in the foundation of special forces as the men who carry out the raids, because these are, these are, these are scientific special forces. And I don't think we talk enough about these kind of people. We don't talk enough about these, the, the aerial reconnaissance experts who, who study these photos, that, 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 that team who identified this black dot on the coast there, because they are in their own way paving the way of how to change warfare just as much as David Sterling and all these people who set up airborne forces. Yeah, that's the great thing about this story. You know, in, in, in the Operation Biting story, you have the scientific special forces heroes and you have the air reconnaissance, you know, RAF and 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 uh, re uh, photo reconnaissance specialist heroes, and they all play a part. They're all part of a greater whole. Without all those parts coming to play, biting would never have been possible. So they are they they are the grist to the mill that makes the special forces operation when it goes in, when the boots hit the ground, when the grenades start to fly, possible and successful. So yeah, you're absolutely right. They are all um, you know, part of the picture, and they they're, they're all vital to a mission such as this one. Yeah. And folks, by the way, the link to the Colonel Remy Association is in the description below, as of course is the link to buying Shadow Raiders and, and the link to Damon's website as well. And so final words on this, because as I say we're saving the actual raid for tomorrow. Um, I guess when you've, you, this is one of your it's mid, mid, your mid series of books. It wasn't your latest one. It wasn't your first one. It's somewhere yeah. in the middle, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think it, from the way you talk about tonight, it's one that's close to your heart, isn't it? I, is it something that kind of represents everything you're trying to do as an historian writer? Well, I think the way it came to me made it special. So I was giving a talk at um, the Malvern Military History Festival years ago. And afterwards, some guy came up, gentleman came up to me and said, look, um, you know, I enjoyed your talk. Um, have you ever heard about Operation Biting? I said, yeah, it's a fantastic mission, really interested in it. I said, unfortunately, I don't think there's a great deal new that one can say. And he said, well, we run, and again, we should have put a link up to this, and we haven't done, but, you know, um, yeah. So we run MRATHS, which is a charity based in uh, Malvern, uh, which preserves the whole radar archive from the Second World War. He said, we have the whole written radar archive, British radar archive from the Second World War. It was about to be destroyed. It was about to be shredded. We've saved it. And he said, we haven't even catalogued it all yet. But would you like access to it? And that was the start of me writing the book, because suddenly there were, you know, roomfuls of documents about this raid, which no one had ever seen before, and which were really, you know, seminal to writing the book. So huge thanks to MRATHS, because they triggered me off on this. I've always been interested in the raid, always, you know, loved this story, but I wanted something new, and that enabled me to do that. So, yeah, it is a, a special uh, story. And then for me, it came to me in a special way. Every book starts with a journey. It starts with a first step. And that was kind of like a glorious first step for me. And what we'll do is we'll add the link to the association uh, after the yeah. event. I'll add it to the description and we, we can go from there. So, again, I think we've, we've pretty much done because Neil's doing the actual attack tomorrow. But um, any final things about the planning or, or the concept of this that you, you would like to get across that, we, that the viewers should know? Just one thing I did want to mention because it's kind of like crazy. Um, <laughs> just got to talk about it. So, the other thing is, one, you don't send a radar expert in to steal a radar because they might steal your radar expert, right? Two, we drop airborne forces in to steal their radar. 
they're going to drop airborne forces in to steal our radar. OK, where was our centre of radar excellence? It was in Swanage on the Dorset Cliff Toss. So pretty much opposite where the raid was taking place. And rightly, they thought, we send this raid in. If this is successful, they're just going to reciprocate. So within a month, we moved this massive, huge radar establishment, top secret radar establishment in Swanage, and they moved it to Malvern. That's how it ended up in Malvern. And that story in itself is absolutely extraordinary. The way they masterminded that operation to make sure if the Germans launched a retaliatory raid, they couldn't steal our secrets is a great part of the story too. And that just uh, exemplifies the whole chess game nature of this, is that we're thinking not just one move ahead, but two or three moves If we do this, they might do that. So we've got to anticipate that by doing this and, and moving our radar away. Genius, genius move. Thankfully, of course, there was no German attack uh, to find what British radar was all about. But it, it just shows you how much the thinking goes into these these operations beyond just it being these daring raids of men jumping out of aircraft and going and blowing things up because that's exactly what we've done today we've talked about this preparation for it so to end, to end things up then what, what are you working on now what's the what's the next project um i am uh writing a book about a uh <laughs> a resistance hero in the second world war um yeah somebody who operated um across a lot of theaters um and his courage is unparalleled. It's not Remy, although he's in the book. It's it's another um, standout, um, amazing, um, wonderful uh, hero who works with a lot of different allied forces to carry out some really extraordinary war-winning um, intelligence gathering and other operations. Yeah. Well, brilliant, because as a Brit living in France, I know there are a stack of great books and resources in French about the resistance activities that most of which don't get translated into English or don't get picked up by an English speaking yeah. author. And you go so to right. a typical museum bookshop here and you see resistance, resistance, and then there's nothing available in English. So it's about in fact, time. In fact, Paul, you are in the acknowledgements of this book. Oh, that's nice. You have helped me with it. You unwittingly have helped me. We've had a conversation, maybe on email, maybe on Zoom, I can't remember, about a year ago. If you look, search back, you might find it. And I, and I, so I said special thanks to you because it was really useful. So. Well, that's been nice. Thank you very much. That's made, made my day, that has. And, uh, you know, again, it's so, it's so important. I mean, I, 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 I repeat myself, a, a brand new book just came out in, in France about the occupation of Normandy. You know, John Kellyanne, who's kind of the French, I don't know, Anthony Beaver, the French Peter Kellyanne Adams, brilliant, you know, goes to the occupation, the bombing raids, the reprisals, the roundups, the uh, the the... And I've asked the publishers, will it be available in English? No, they're not, they, they, they can't do it. They can't afford to do it. And I'm thinking that all the people who are watching this would, le would, would lap these types of histories up, but it needs people like yourself to provide the bridge. Do you know what part of the problem is? I don't want to kind of like be, be a techie about it, but in the publishing world, once you go beyond a certain number of words, the translation costs are... Oh, I guess horrendous. Important. So what it requires is it needs a fund. It needs somebody a philanthropist or a government to fund these translations because you're absolutely right if you did get them published in english they would have a massive readership yeah it's, it's the same old thing we, we history is still being told nationalistically british we write about it for a british audience americans for an american canadian so and so and what i'm trying to do on this channel is bring in i mean i'm just planning romania at war week and of the guests three are romanians it Brilliant. seems important to me that if you're talking about a country in world war ii have people from that country talking yeah. about it it's yeah, uh, well done it's progressive. So anyway, that's it. I, I will just remind me what people were coming up, and I'll say goodbye in a second, Damon. So tomorrow in the afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, but if you're in the UK, 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, GMT, we are going through the raid on Brunaval itself with Neil Cherry and his squeaky chairs. That'll be fantastic. Though he has oiled it, apparently. So we won't have Neil's squeaky chair giving its extra opinion there. And we've got video I took on location there a few days ago to do that. And Neil is the guy to go through. He'll tell you how many grenades each paratrooper had because that's what neil does uh, as usual don't forget to follow what we're doing on social media share the links click like subscribe and consider becoming a patron or channel member and again to remind you the association colonel remy association the link below and the purchasing of damien's shadow raiders book is in the description below so there we are thank you very much damien it's always a pleasure talking to you i can't wait to book you again for show number five i think that will be in the next one this is number four yes. i think brilliant yeah, I love it.
Brilliant. I will see you then. So, folks, have a good week, everybody. I will see you all again tomorrow. And, of course, we've got another show tomorrow evening about the Battle of Java Sea, which was also happening 80 years ago this week. There's no rest for the wicked. Cheers, everybody. Have a good Saturday. Bye.